At Fort St. Elmo on Malta, some reenactors had a stall with various interesting weapons on it. Well, look, there's one of those falchion thingies from the Morgan Bible. Did they exist? Well, they do now. This thing requires explanation. It's a reenactor's safety version of a morning star. Rather than long spikes, they have short nodules on a hollow sphere. If that thing was solid, it would be farcically heavy. But what's this? Drum roll, please. Thank you. This is... Right. This is... It's a Venetian weapon that I'll tell about. It's a Venetian weapon that I'll tell you about just as soon as this lad finishes the drum. Good. Now, it... In the 50... Right, I've lost patience now. Now here we have an interesting weapon. It's uh, about five fingers broad, and it has a name which in Italian means precisely that, which is... Cinque dea or cinque dita in simple Italian. Yes, it's a, it's a beautiful word to be stabbed by. <laughs> so, um, what was this designed for, do you think? Yes, this, we believe, that was designed for the narrow streets of Venice for civilian use rather than military use. Now, I know people get to ask me, is it a dagger or is it a sword? Well, yeah, it sort of hovers in that territory. Uh, the smallest ones have blades about a foot long, and to me, I would definitely say they are dagger-like. Uh, but the really big ones have blades perhaps 25 inches long, and that's sword territory. So, um, yeah, they're from one end to the other. A lot of them are in the sort of 18 to 20 inches blade length. So, yes, what is that? Is it a gargantuan dagger or a very small sword? Why do you think it was so wide? Well, maybe it's so wide because it can add um, in the strength when one is defending against a longer blade with more momentum um, and it makes also a wider wound because when you step the more in you go in the enemy the wider the blade becomes so the wider the the wound is but by the time you've got to the really wide bit you would have put it all the way through him wouldn't you yes well it would have been very thorough then so how practical do I think that these blades were? Um, not terribly. Uh, for one thing, uh, as far as I know, all the evidence is that they were carried by civilians and not by soldiers. They weren't used in war. If these were good, well, they would have been used in war, wouldn't they? Um, now, if you have a parallel-sided blade, that's good for stabbing. So something like a rondel, once you've gone through the armour and the skin, which is the difficult bit, then you're into the flesh, and if you push with a force of, let's say, one, and that is going into your enemy deeper and deeper. Well, if you carry on pushing at force one, it'll go ever deeper. And depth of stab is what causes shock, is what punctures internal organs, is what causes hemorrhaging, is what kills your opponent. Um, now, if the blade is widening all the time, you have to push harder and harder and harder, cutting wider and wider through their armor sideways in order to get anywhere. So you're making it actually more difficult to stab deeply into your opponent. So, no, I don't think it's a terribly practical shape for stabbing people. Uh, what about chopping? Well, no, all the weight's down by the hilt. If you want to chop really well, you put, like with an axe, a felling axe, say you put all the weight at the tip end, and that swings into your opponent and chops more effectively. So these are neither good for chopping nor stabbing, by shape, that is. Um, but what they are good for is etching and gilding. You see, if you want to show off, it's a wonderful canvas, this. Uh, the, the smith can put in loads and loads of fullers and interesting patterns, and uh, that's uh, afforded by this very wide blade, and you've got loads of space to, to put pictures of, of saints and, and ancestors and so forth on. So I think that's actually why these were the way they were. Yes, they are quite practical in a compromise between dagger and sword for fighting in the narrow alleyways of Venice rather than the open battlefield, but really it's, it's swagger. It's the man about town, the well-to-do guy wanting to show everyone a bit of bling. Ooh, look at the decoration on my blade. Um, so I think really that's why they were popular, and that would also explain why they didn't last very long. They were only popular in the 15th and early 16th century, and then they were gone. Now granted, there were some precedents for this shape. Uh, this uh, Iberian dagger, for instance, dates to the 3rd or 4th century BC, but these things were never very common and never lasted very, very long, because I don't think they were really terribly good for the actual business of, you know, killing people. 
Do you think this was designed to be used against other people with the same sort of weapon, or it was designed to get the advantage over people with longer weapons in a, in a narrow alleyway? Well, it does a bit of both. Um, however, preferably in a narrow alleyway, um, you could have someone with, the, with a longer sword, it will take him longer to unsheath his weapon. In that time, you could have already stabbed him and left him there to die. All the museum examples that I've seen, okay, yes, granted they're the ones that you put on display that tend to be the fancier ones, but they've all been very fancy. I've never seen one with a completely plain blade. Even if it doesn't have all the fancy etchings and gildings, it's at least got a very complicated pattern of fullers going up the, uh, up the blade. Sometimes you have five of them, like five fingers, sometimes four, which divides it into five ridges, uh, but uh, just as often you have three and two and one and so forth. There are lots of different patterns of fullers where the, uh, the smiths were showing off um, I think these are really principally designed for aesthetic reasons rather than practical. This is um, a simplified version actually, much of the originals. I've seen some at the Palazzo Ducale in Venice and other places in the Stibert in Florence. Mm -hmm. um, they are very, very nicely decorated, very intricately decorated. And how would you have carried one of these? So it was usually worn, we believe, um, at the back, strapped at the back in this manner, so it takes very little energy to unsheath and you're ready to fend off the enemy. There may be other pictures that give evidence of this, but the only one I know about is this one in the British National Gallery. Can you see it? There's this guy in the background carrying some timber and a fainting woman, and between them is this chap, wearing up-to-the-minute contemporary 1501 Italian costume. Ironically, though, I think this chap is playing the part of a soldier in the picture, which is not very civilian of him. Although, immediately, I think that if it's behind you um, and I were planning to assassinate you with my friend, I would get my friend to come up behind you and just stand, perhaps even putting his hand, to make it difficult for you to draw it. Maybe, and yes. And then I'd attack you. Yes, good plan. <laughs> Thanks. I was rather proud of it. <laughs>